Hello and welcome to a new video. On this channel I posted a while ago a Sarabande, which I composed, a short Baroque dance movement. And I did this in order to actually show how to compose a short Baroque dance movement. And today I want to guide you through the steps I think are sensible in order to undertake this effort. And yes, I hope it's uh, something you can apply to your own method of composing. And let's get right into it. So how to compose in Baroque style, a quick guide to writing a short dance movement. So I propose three steps. First, the preparation. What do I want to compose? Second, the execution. So composing the actual piece. And as a third step, embellishing and correcting minor mistakes. In our situation, the preparation would be, okay, we want to compose a Baroque dance movement and we have to kind of think what this actually means. The execution will be done in two steps. So first, compose a two-part structure and then add a third, basically a middle voice. And then of course the refinement would possibly entail ornamentations like trillos, mordants and the like. Now the first question you might have is why do I have to first do the two-part structure and then add the third vo voice, right? So maybe you think, okay, I'm I'm quite experienced in basso continuo, maybe I can write four-part movements. I will deal just fine with three voices. Well, I beg to differ because uh, you want to have the maximum quality in your outer voice movement. A third voice could conceal some little, maybe not even errors, but some inadequacies, um, aesthetic minor imbalances between the outer voices, because you immediately have a little bit of harmonic richness, you have chords, and it might distract just from maybe some uh, things that, that are not sophisticated, not elegant, uh, not interesting enough. And you actually want to have both. You want to have the interesting outer voice structure, which can almost kind of stand for its own. And then with the second step, you want to add to this very interesting structure, the harmonic richness provided by the third voice. And you will not certainly not achieve this by immediately composing with three voices. At least that's my experience. Now, what do we need for the preparation? First of all, we have to be clear about which kind of dance we want to compose. The dance is closely linked to the meter. And I just threw a couple of suggestions here on the board. Two dances in 4-4 four, four meter, for example, the Alimont and the Gavotte, and two in 3-4 meter, the Sarabande and the Minuet. Now the Allemande has quite often a short upbeat, an eighth note, for example. It's quite uh, complex, you could say, because very often composers uh, do some intricate imitative work between the voices and it has a moderate tempo. I actually would rather recommend to do the Gavotte for beginners because the Gavotte is a bit simpler but keep in mind the Gavotte very typically has two quarter notes upbeat and also has a moderate tempo. Yes, so maybe start with the Gavotte instead of the Allemande. And in the 3-4 meter you have, you can do the Sarabande, which I actually did. The Sarabande has a slow tempo and very often there's a characteristic rhythm depicted here. So quarter note, a dotted quarter note and an eighth note. It is recommended to use it, but 
actually you will see in my composition, which is a sarabande, this rhythm doesn't really play a role. So there are also examples where this just doesn't quite occur. Uh, it's quite a heavy um, form of rhythm because you have, uh, in effect, you have two um, emphasis in one bar. So the first beat is the normal just accent and then the second beat is also emphasized because um, of the dotted note. So it's, it's a longer note, right? So this is also a bit heavy. And I think I would just say go with your intuition in this case. And also you can compose a minuet, which is a simple dance with a moderate tempo. Now, when you're clear about that, you can think about the form. Now, basically every dance, every Baroque dance can be written in a simple two-part structure, A and B. Both parts are to be repeated. B can be a little bit longer than A, but it also can be of equal length. Now, alternatively, you can also use the later minuet form, like the late Baroque minuet form, which will be also the classical minuet form. You can apply this also to other dances. It doesn't really have to be the minuet. I saw also other dances using this form, so this should be fine. And basically you have also A, B, but you have a little recapitulation after the B, and we could call this A prime. And the second part, therefore, comprising B and A tends to be much longer than the first part. And basically it's, it's a weird mix of two part form, which is indicated by the repetitions and a three part form, which is indicated motivically by A, B and A. Now, you also have to be um, kind of knowledgeable about what you can actually do in terms of cadences, at least the cadences in the very end of a form part. In the A part, you can do an authentic cadence in the first scale degree. You can also do a semi-cadence in the first scale degree. So, for example, when you're in C major, you can end on G major, but G major is a dominant, so you are still in C major. But you can also, and that's very often done, modulate into the fifth scale degree and do an authentic cadence in that degree. This is in major. Now for the B part in major, you should actually just a cadence and do a cadence in the, in the first scale degree. In rather rare, rare instances, you have maybe also a semi-cadence in the first scale degree, but then there's an expectation that the next movement will follow attacka. So I think that's not very often done, at least in major. Now for the cadences in minor, you can conclude the first part again in the first scale degree. Again, you can do a semi-cadence in the first scale degree. But the typical goal when you modulate would be the third scale degree. So kind of the relative key of the tonic. You, I guess you also can go into the fifth scale degree, but if you do rather choose the diatonic fifth scale degree, so a minor chord, this would blend much better with your tonic for the whole piece. Now, with regarding the end of a minor piece, the very end, like the end in the B part, you can do an authentic cadence just in, in the first scale degree, or which is also, I think, a bit more often done than in major, you can do a semi-cadence. But then again, you have the expectation that the next piece will follow Ataka. Now, obviously, I chose implicitly this more simple form, the simple AB form. It's different when you use the later minuet form, right? I wanted to focus on a simpler model, which I also uh, took um, yeah, as a framework for my composition. Now, before you end in the B part, you can uh, choose several degrees where you can do 
uh, cadences on the way. For example, the second or the fourth scale degree, which are kind of uh, the subdominant region, or the sixth scale degree, which would be at least in major the relative key. Now, let's go to the execution. And the first step composing a two part structure. You could call so or could, could, you could also call this a monodic structure because this means having a melody and then having a basso continuo. Now, you can start with the bass, but you can also start with the melody. It rather depends on what comes into your mind, which idea enters your intuition. So both approaches can work. Uh, I, I don't think there's any advantage. It's really a subjective thing. A very typical thing would be writing eight bars. This could already be the first form part, but it doesn't have to be. The first form part can be also a little bit longer. So eight bars could be neatly subdivided into four plus four, which is actually almost mandatory for dance music because there has to be a sort of a predictability regarding the steps although although this is not real dance music so it's not meant to be danced but it still refers to actual dances so yes you don't have to be four plus four you can loosen it up a bit but you shouldn't completely stray off uh, these uh, guidelines i think now, you could structure this 4 plus 4 um, subdivision into a period, which actually would mean that you would subdivide the 4 bars into 2 plus 2. For example, A plus B, and then A plus B prime, or C. Now, let's go to my example. You see a two-part structure, 8 bars semi-cadence in the end of the fourth bar, authentic cadence in the end of the, in, in the eighth bar. So let's listen to that. So this works. I didn't, again, I didn't compose a third voice immediately. I really only composed these two voices. And I think it's interesting enough to stand almost on its own. Um, obviously, when you have, uh, for example, the, the octave in the end, this is kind of mandatory regarding the, the clauses, so the kind of melodic cadences. And so the third voice eventually would be very nice in order to fill up the chord and also other instances it would just be nice to have a third voice but in of itself it's quite acceptable uh, already and that should be your goal so the two-part movement really should should be the main focus on your work it should be as good as you can uh, yeah as you can make it so motivically actually we see that i composed a period so we've got the a part then the b part then again the a part and then you have kind of a c part so something different which then also concludes the a bar structure with an authentic cadence and here also a, a very useful detail regarding the final cadence. I did a hemiola cadence. So let's listen to the hemiola cadence again. Yes, so the hemiola cadence works that you have basically two, three, four bars and you convert them into three, two, four bars. So it's kind of a implicit break in the meter, but you don't write it out. It's 
implied. It's not written out. And this makes your cadence a bit stronger and also longer and therefore stronger, you could say. And it's a very, very typical thing to do in Baroque three, four meter dances. So you also see it in the courant and the jig, which would be six, eight. So anything uh, that that has kind of a triple vibe, you can do these himiolas. Regarding how you compose or how your intuition works or how how um, well you are able to formulate a melody. Implicit chords might be a good option, a good guideline for you, a good orientation. So you take the, if you, if you more, the, more like a bass uh, inventor, right? You have your bass line and what you should do next is do a harmonization of that bass line. If you struggle with the melody, if you don't quite know where you should go with the melody. So the harmonization should be, of course, um, in a Baroque style. And this will give you some harmonic areas where your melody can be placed. Let's listen to this rendition of my bass line with a, basso, a very simple basso continuo harmonization. You will see that actually my composition adheres to this implicit harmonization, right? Now, also what you see now is that the entire eight bars only consist of cadential progressions. So for example, the B part, which would be the first two bars, is kind of a very weak uh, five one. So the G major going to C major. Then you have the semi cadence, and then because bar five and six are merely a repetition of one and two, again a very weak five one, and seamlessly going on then the hemiola cadence. So that's actually totally fine. You don't quite have the space maybe for elaborate sequences, right? In a dance movement, you will have. Yeah, of course you will have sequences, but maybe more often in a B part, not so often in the A part. Again, depending how long, how many bars you have at your disposition, basically. And I really wanted to have a very short yeah, first part. Now, the second step of the execution would be adding a third voice. Couple of things to um, to say about the third voice. It's very important that you have in mind that this third voice has an entirely different character than the other two voices. The other two voices are the outer voices. They are the substantive, sub, sorry, they are the substantive voices, substantial voices, you could say. The third voice is not that. It's a middle voice. It's so to speak, less important to the overall structure. And therefore it can also enter and leave the structure quite freely. And you actually should, I think, use the third voice in that sense. So that means you should use pauses a lot. So don't start immediately with the third voice. Maybe just sneak it in, right? On a light beat um, with a, after a pause. And by doing it like this, you will have the harmonic richness. It wouldn't sound too naked, which is sometimes the case with only two, two voices, but it, it's still light and elegant and not too heavy. Uh, I think you can say this non-substantial middle voice has three tasks or roles. You can complete fragmented chords. 
always depends on the voice setting. Voice setting should always be acceptable, right? Um, kind of parsimonious, not always jumping um, up and down. You can even use kind of broken chords, which is even lighter, right? A bit more elegant, a bit more fluent than uh, chords which are more vertical. Second role would be support supporting the melody with lower sixths or lower thirds. And the third role would be kind of a transition between formal boundaries. So after the fourth bar, a little transition to the next four bars, or even at the end of the A part, a little transition back to the first bar because you recapitulation, right? So keep these three different roles in mind. Now let's see what I did. So this is the A part now with the third voice and a little bit more than you saw before. It's now 10 bars instead of eight because I allowed myself to sneak in a little deceptive cadence where I had before, I had uh, here just an authentic cadence and now with this A minor deception, I actually have the motivation or the necessity even to repeat the cadence, which I do here. And so deceptive cadence is a very nice and very typical way in order to enhance your final cadence of the form part. So these are the different roles my third voice uh, takes on. So here I just highlighted some instances. I didn't go to every um, part of the piece because it's just, I think I just want to make my point. So here uh, completing the chords in the beginning, um, a little transition phrase in bar four and the broken chords in bar six and seven and also lower thirds supporting the melody in bar 9 and again broken chords in bar 10. Now we actually did all the steps with the A part and it's actually up to you how you do it. You can do step 1, so just a two-part movement and you can just compose the whole piece, right? And then add the third voice. I actually composed the first part, um, two voices, and then added the third voice, and then I did these steps again uh, with the B part. I just want to show you what I did in this B part. Um, it is always nice to have a little bit of, uh, of imitation, even when you have a qu quite a simple style. Just a small Im imitation is a nice thing to do, and I chose to use my beginning motive, this kind of the descending uh, fifth um, with a third in the middle, so it's very triadic, right? I took this, put it on the fifth scale degree, and then there's a lower fifth imitation in the bass, and then there's even a fake imitation in the tenor, uh, or let's just call it in the middle voice. So rhythmically, the upbeat you hear it kind of as an imitation and it really doesn't have to be a real imitation, right? A fake imitation is totally fine. It's very beautiful. It's not too strict, right? And then you have all these, all these kinds of rules I, I talked about before. So the lower, lower sixth in this case, supporting the melody, broken chords, completing the chords, all that good stuff. And so this is my B part and let's just listen to this section.
Okay. And so, of course, you could call it B1, so it's not the whole B part. Um, this one is the second B part, where I actually have to get back to my uh, tonic, which would be C major. And here you can use the sequence, uh, any sequence you like. Um, I obviously went for the descending fifth sequence. But just a very short sequence, doesn't have to be extensive, it shouldn't be an extensive sequence. And so there's kind of a little bit of a surprise. The main theme comes after two bars. Um, I thought that would be a nice, uh, nice uh, tweak of the formula. If you actually do a little repetition, you can do it also in these small um, AB forms. Normally you would do it after four bars. I do it after two bars. So a little bit of a surprise here, but you also, you don't have to yeah, reconnect with the beginning. That was just my intuition. So just something I went with. And of course I heavily depended on the like first motive, this kind of a triadic motive here, um, which kind of gives me the material for doing the sequence. Let's go to the third step. It's about the refinement. And what I did was uh, threefold. So I added appoggiaturas, trillos and mordents. Appoggiaturas are kind of like suspensions, which you don't have to be prepare, but which have to be kind of uh, melodically integrated, you could say. So it's kind of an embellishment of the third in the beginning. And then you have these uh, yeah, trillo, mordant, lower mordant in this case. So where you think it might embellish something, you can add them. Let's just listen to the ornamented version of the A part and the B part, so the whole piece. So finally, uh, when we go back to the big picture, when we think of, okay, how, how do I really actually get to a very decent um, Baroque style? It won't happen within weeks. It won't happen, uh, certainly won't happen within days, maybe not even months. It depends on how much you know intuitively, right? So it's all about feeding your intuition. What I talked about today was planning and kind of uh, steps you could do in order to be very efficient. But uh, the most important thing always with composition, I think, is intuition. And so your goal should be to feed your intuition and you should have always your goal in mind. So if, for example, when you uh, have the goal to compose a gavotte, you should look at tons of gavottes, play them, 
analyze them, see what pe people do, um, motivically, cadence-wise, stuff like this. What do they do with the third voice? Maybe there are even more voices. And in this case, I can re recommend basically all these books with the title Pièce de Clavecin. Here I have three authors, Dandrieu, Coupron, and Rameau. This is really good stuff, uh, especially I think Dandrieu, because Dandrieu is somebody who is fairly easy to imitate, I would say. Rameau is very, very sophisticated. It's, um, it's a bit, maybe a bit like Bach, so it might be, not be the best idea to imitate Bach or have Bach as a model because you might just uh, be depressed, right? Because you don't, you can't possibly maybe reach uh, Bach or you can't possibly reach Rameau. There are some really crazy ideas in Rameau dance movements. Um, but anyways, it's good to look at this stuff, to look at Don Rieu. Coupron, also very, very typical, um, classical in the sense of uh, something you should strive to to imitate. And the more you play, the more you will know intuitively. And the better your intuition, the less planning you actually have to do, right? Because things will automatically go your way. And of course, this intuition, this will just build up in matters of months and years, and not within days and weeks. Thank you for listening and for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video about how to compose a Baroque dance movement. And please let me know in the comments uh, what, what you want to know, maybe additionally to what I've said, or maybe you have some criticism, maybe you want to do things differently, or you have different experiences. And I'm always happy to, to grow and to learn. So, um, yeah, critical feedback, positive feedback. I always love feedback, basically. And yes, I'm happy to see you again in the next video. Bye.